So good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, this session, Author Meets uh, Readers. They're supposed to start at 11. The chairman for this session is Professor Olainka Akonle. Um, I think he's not able to join. Is he there? Oh, great. So the chair is online. So I'm going to hand over to the chair. Professor Akonle, thank you. You have the floor. Now, good morning, everybody. Good morning, sir. Yeah, it gives me great joy to, to chair this panel. And we thank everyone for, for making time to attend this meeting. And just accept my apologies so that I might want to, I might not want to release my video, but just let me release it a little so that we can see this place I am is a little dark. So, and also for bandwidth. So, we welcome, we're happy to have everyone here. This session is particularly very important for us to, for it's about uh, an output that have been put together to honor um, our mentor, uh, uh, Professor Omota De Akiaino. So we just want to be looking at his uh, the fresh shifts in his honor, social policy and transformation in Africa. A fresh shift for Professor Omota De Akiaino. So, and um, I thank everyone for making this meeting. So what, what I'll just suggest is that I'll, I will not want to waste um, our time. 
so that we can make the best of this session. So we we'll just quickly go over what we are here for. This is this session we run till twelve thirty, and we have discussants as a professor Abbas said, the Babatunde of the university. This is not an introduction; it's just to set the background. So I will still um, call on every one of us to use ourselves. So, Professor Abbasai De Babatunde of the University. I'm here. Of... Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Thank ma. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much well, for the opportunity yeah. to be part of Libya. Yeah. Well, Thank you very much, ma. We have Professor uh, Becky Moyo of the University of Witwatersrand, Strand, South Africa. Is Professor Becky Moyo in the house? I'm here. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank then we have Professor you. David O.K. Professor David O.K. O.K. University of Lagos. Is Professor David O.K. in the house? Yeah, I'm here. I'm an associate professor. <laughs> prof, you are a professor. Never mind. It's OK. <laughs> then uh, I also have Professor Omalara Kodri of uh, University of Lagos. Is Professor Omalara in the house? Professor Kodri? Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm also an associate professor. <laughs> you, are a pro you are a professor. Uh, then we have respondents to this. Um, with the respondent listed here are uh, Professor Tadi Aino. Thank you very much of MasterCard. Then we have Professor Ume Bameke of the University of Lagos, who is also a co-editor. Uh, professor Luwadare uh, Durowade of Malcolm S College, who is also a co-editor to respond. Uh, Sam, Professor Samuel Olorun Choba of Kachin University as co-editor. And it's very important for me to mention also that the book is available online at uh, African Books Collective. So uh, we are also encouraged to, pour, to publicize this book for people to benefit from the wealth of experience that have come together in this book. So and I'm honored to be part of this wonderful session. So I don't know if you can just take a, a minute to introduce ourselves appropriately in case that somebody wants to say something wants to say, if that is fine. Mm -hmm. Can we take like have a minute to introduce uh, ourselves? Um, I can see we have five online participants. The LSA is served, uh, Professor Bosse, Professor Becky, and Professor Tade, I know. So, on the ground, in the, can you please take one minute to, or 30 seconds to introduce yourself? Please, once you are done with your introduction, can you call, tap somebody to introduce? Yes, uh, Dr. David. Okay, I'm an associate professor of economics at the University of Lagos. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Prof. To Prof's right, Madam. Thank you very much, Prof. My name is Miriam Omolara Podri. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Political Science, University of Lagos. Thank you very much. I appreciate you, Prof. Then after, next person, please. <laughs> <laughs> Next person. Thank you, Prof. My name is Pumi Bameke. I'm of the Department of Sociology, University of Lagos. I'm particularly excited today because Professor Motade, I know, is um, quite special to us in the Department of Sociology, and I'm so glad that this is taking place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Bameke. Glad to see you. I really can see you, but I'm glad to hear you. <laughs> Thank you sir, so much. <laughs> My name is Samuel Oloron Toma. I'm at the Institute of African Studies, Carlton University, and I'm privileged to be here to launch this book in honor of Professor Sandy Aino. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to see you. I think we met last in South Africa. Uh, always, always happy to see your footprint digitally. Uh, <laughs> next, please. Dari Dorowade, Department of Social Sciences, Malcolm S. College, Chicago. Nice Thank you very much, bro. Thank you. Thank you very 
Okay, we can as well move on at this time so that we can save time because we have this wonderful book to talk about. And I celebrate everyone who made the book possible. Thank you very, well, very much. I, will, I recognize the hard work that went into the making of that book. And it's always very nice to, for us to It's always very good when we have to, to have output like that. So um, without much ado, and I don't know the order we want to go, but we have to agree. Uh, the discussant, I will allow Professor um, Abosede Babatunde to take the floor to- Thank you very much, Because it's good, yeah. please, uh, for want of time, Take between five, um, five and eight minutes to discuss the book. So we have um, four discussants. And since we have just uh, one, so discussants, please take five minutes maximum of eight to discuss uh, the book. So Professor Boss said the, the floor is yours. After uh, you, then will be Professor Becky Moyo. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. I also want to acknowledge um, Professor Omar Tadiakiaina, who this book is published in his honor. Um, this book on social policy and transformation in Africa. South Africa, and it encompasses various African countries. It also highlights the challenges with the social protection policy across the world, linked to the key challenges identified with the neoliberal globalization processes. But it actually captures the African content highlighting that Africa has very deep challenges of social protection policy for citizens. And also it considers the fact that like China, India have been able to address some of the challenges, but Africa has not been able to do so, particularly because of the challenges with the um, predatory elite corruption that permeates many African countries. And also at the same time, they provided these perspectives about the conceptual theoretical underpinning of social protection and social policy. And at the same time, some of the chapters address on issues about state citizen relation, issues about even the conceptualization of um, social policy linked to some of Professor Tadia Ezinon's work. But Hello, Prof, we can't hear you. Okay, now. And there are some of the gaps in what Professor Ezinon work on social policy of capture, particularly looking at the connection between human values and social imaginaries. But at the same time, I think it's not so clear because when we look at issues about human values and um, ideology, then when we consider issues of social imaginaries, because they frame it as an ideal that can bring about envisaging the right social policy for Nigeria and other people. But at the same time, we about in policy itself or challenge with the implementation of this Socialized social policy as a collective um, effort to at least create condition and promotion. As a collective effort, who 
are the people that are central to what implement are on the state. But we need to look at it that if social policy is about collective effort, state action, we discuss issue about individual focusing on philanthropy, the issue about religion so, uh, by religious value. But then we have to consider what you have no state at to play beyond the case of civil society yeah. that I said. For example, some of the um, chapter of us, my daughter, highlighting some of the gaps in the social policies of government over time in terms of yeah, intervention agency building the effort harness. But even why they capture the issues about the father, what is provided is not sufficient. They also emphasize the issue about how local leaders are also part of the predatory something. But at the same time, if we are advocating for transformation and transformational social policy, what role do not state actor like this traditional leader? Because the emphasis is about the challenge with the state. What about challenge with other? As a collective effort, and uh, I emphasize them, um, Professor Motade's um, uh, he, um, focus on human values. Then we need to understand that the macro and macro level about how human values that undermine people to embrace the kind of values that can make them to. Um, that is vital to be able to do, do what it takes to implement policy. So the effort state alone is not sufficient. So I think we should look at all these dynamics. So I think there are a lot of important issues that have been discussed in the work. But my key challenge is the aspect of excessive focus on the state. While we downplay the aspect of even citizen the role citizen can play, the role non-state actor can play in what the implementation of effective social policy in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. We, we appreciate you. We appreciate your intervention. We thank you very much for that uh, passionate and very lucid, uh, excellent uh, contribution. So we have a for Professor Becky Moyo. Thank you so much. My utmost pleasure really to today. Um and I couldn't be online. I mean on in person there, I'm joining virtually. I had the pleasure earlier on to get a call from Tade uh, and I panicked because I thought I was late for the session. I know the Aina, probably of the most lucky people uh, since his time uh, at Cordestria where he served as the deputy executive secretary. And most of us here in this uh, um, you know, gathering would, would know the, the kind of work and the issues that Cordestria has driven over the years through scholarship, uh, especially in the area of social policy. And many times time you would call us that, that belonged to Cordestria as members. Um, drove a policy. We've got the likes of Jimmy Ateshina and others that are still working. And so that's one, one track uh, in which I uh, to the work that uh, Tati has done um, in his uh, past life that continues to shape some of our thinking. 
But for me, secondly, uh, in my earlier youthful uh, stage, I have a Ford found uh, uh, Ginger. He was already leading of work in Eastern Africa, focusing on issues of social justice. And um, and most of you actually work closely and know the food. Know it is day is focused on at least that were shaped by what was called the gather issues around education issues around issues around the economic development uh, issues among human if you look at the work of this in east africa at the time that it really Specifically for me, to start, it was called and tell other representatives of the Ford Foundation were responsible for thinking and um, putting together a organization that currently is based in Senegal, Dakar, but operates across the country. Not only was Tad a part of the team that was doing that, he actually went on to actually name Trust Africa because um and and during that time, uh, we also then Tad and I went on to work on a book published uh, um and right now that book is used in several platforms. Uh, in African universities as a source for, but also a source for, and that book is called uh, Helping to Give and, and, and Giving to Help, full chapter that looks at this, uh, the interface between philanthropy and politics um, from a historical perspective. And as I'm running two institutes, Pascal was running the Southern Africa Trust, and we're both focusing on issues of uh, policy governance, but also dealing with the contestations of funding, especially with forms of funding. Um, and then currently, you know, before time, the MasterCard Foundation here and the colleagues here established African film. And we have gone on to collaborate, I think is, uh, most successful, but also telling projects that is looking at the vision of the uh, towards creating dignified in Africa, and that bears all the footprints. Uh, I'm saying this because I don't want to talk about what I wrote about it because I think colleagues will have time to read about it. But this was important. I therefore had to 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 dedicate a was that which focuses can philanthropy because if there is one person who has a huge role in terms of shaping the different forms of philanthropy but also thinking and writing about them it is Tati himself and so I dedicated the chapter in the book that focused on uh, philanthropy pre and post COVID times. And in that chapter, we look at what philanthropy looks like in the continent, which Tati and I have actually written about. But we also looked at the trends that we then saw during the times of COVID, looking, for example, around how international donors either scaled back or some of them actually began giving more because they thought this was the time that they needed to do so. We are also looking at how individuals you know, in each country also decided to really come on board and support uh, communities that were affected by COVID. We are also looking at trends that include how high net worth individuals for the first time decided to give seven times more than they'd ever done in, in 10 years time. And so these are some of the trends that we were, were, were referring to in the book, but the, the whole idea was really to dedicate a chapter on philanthropy because study has played a huge role in defining and shaping the direction of philanthropy. And so I want to end by really going back to where I started that I, I still think that there's a, a, a lot of work that Tade um, will still do in the area of social policy because philanthropy is really a multidisciplinary uh, area that covers all these issues. 
and there cannot be any social policy focus without the kind of resources that Tate is currently working with, but also deploying towards the, re the resolution of Africa's challenges. I thank you. claim perspective that you put it to it and uh, they're linking it effectively with your chapter. Thank you very much. I must also I like your background um, of where you are. So um, then the next thing for us to do is to invite the the next uh, discussant, Professor David Doke of the University of Lagos. Please make your intervention. Thank you very much. And I must also appreciate our discussant uh, thus far for keeping to time and even saving some time for us for more critical engagement. Thank you very much. Professor David, okay, your, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I want to appreciate uh, Professor Zadie. Uh, actually, I don't know him, but because I'm younger than me in the faculty, but I'm very privileged to review uh, the book. <laughs> so the book, uh, has 16 chapters and written by 22 scholars. And the book was quite interesting to read. Uh, I did enjoy reading it. And uh, I also want to appreciate the editors, uh, one of which is my former dean, Professor Mameke, the Dean of Faculty of Social Sciences. And, for the first time meeting uh, the children. So, uh, so I also want to appreciate uh, all the discussion. Uh, the first discussion has actually uh, discussed the book uh, succinctly, but I'd like to make a few contributions. Uh, first is that the book uh, makes emphasis on social policy and the writers trying to explain such policy as the collective public government addressing developmental challenges in Africa. And the focus likely is to eradicate uh, poverty uh, to reduce uh, inequality. It is has to ensure that Africa experiences inclusive development. Again, uh, one of the uh, observations by the writers was that such policy itself is not adequate. Uh, therefore, transformation of such policy is quite important. And it was uh, this, uh, explained that such policy uh, we only or seeks to uh, <coughs> reduce or address the uh, challenges that the vulnerable in the society face. So uh, the, social, uh, the transformation of social policy uh, will not only address the problems faced by the vulnerable, but also uh, everyone in society. Again, so uh, the right is certainly uh, additional and applied that a social a transformation of social policy, quite important is the provision of health and the continuous investment, continuous investment in education, as well as the pension reform and the instruments for social or transformation of social policy. Of course, uh, other economics, uh, I also saw that in, in the book, uh, it's saying that the international organization, for instance, the World Bank, has not really met in the area of social uh, protection. Of course, uh, we do know that one of the goals of the World Bank, especially, is to end poverty, which is poor, you know, protecting the people uh, from poverty. Of course, the vision of the World Bank uh, is to end poverty, and of course, in their mission, is to also ensure that extreme poverty 
you know, is ended. And that the shared values or the shared prosperity of countries, you know, are increased then. The issue then is what actually the gap in terms of the intervention of the World Bank in addressing this social protection in Africa. Of course, we do look in economics that <clears throat> uh, self interest is key, including the government, the social individual, the constraints of self interest. But of course, at any point in time, that the uh, public interest overrides at any point shouldn't override the private interest. Okay, and we do know that the Africa has a very small share of outputs in the global economy. As of today, by the results of UNECA, uh, Africa shares three percent of the global economy and has about 18,000, maybe 18 percent of the world population compared to United States, and has more than 20 percent of the proportion of the global economy. So, the, the, the United States of America, for instance, it has the power of policy and the political will, you know, to actually uh, it, uh, influence somehow in a way exactly uh, what we do in the World Bank. But the World Bank, as an organization, uh, seeks to uh, drive uh, the share prosperity of countries, ensuring that that's improved. Okay, so it's in the book, uh, it's quite important that for us to attain social transformation of social policy, we must continue to, uh, you know, ensure that we practice democracy, uh, the government of uh, the people, by the people and for the people, and that the leaders must be visionary. And, uh, and that we must always have inclusive governance in Africa. For me, that's the gap in terms of visionary elements. Like the first discussion I actually said about the PJ3 elements that we also have. Of course, I'm not quite interested in the book, is the need to find the indigenous approach to solving the problem of Africa. And it was actually uh, pinpointed in the book that the production of goods and services in addressing uh, indigenous approach, that we must ensure that uh, as a continent, we continue to produce, of course, to feed the people uh, whose security is key, and not just to be the producer of raw materials only, but being able to produce a finished goods so that we can grow as a continent. Of course, as part of it is also innovation. And for me, efficiency and productivity, they are key for us to drive innovation. Of course, innovation technology, uh, adoption and improvement in technology itself to drive innovation, and also scale efficiency and productivity of the continent. Again, as part of indigenous approach to solving these problems, of course, I find that this distribution of welfare packages, which has to do with the application of resources, and it was identified that the NGO, you know, they are uh, doing well, and they stand to bridge a wide gap in terms of resources for the migration continent. And one of the uh, political experts in the country, uh, Professor Olurudi, you know, also pointed out in the book that democracy is yet to actually meet its expectation in Africa. In essence, it's quite important that we must continue to interrogate our democracy, ensuring that this democracy works and that the dividends of democracy is attained. Again, the book tries to see the influence of uh, economic globalization as, as, as far as liberalism, neoliberalism is concerned, and not contributing to maximizing social welfare 
in Africa. And the question is whether capitalism is bad in itself. And the answer for me is no. Because, for instance, legislative practices inform capitalism. Unlike Africa, we have practice primitive capitalism. I started to find the book about the African leaders you know, tending uh, to acknowledge wealth you know, uh, to the detriment of uh, the generality in Africa. So, for me to end, one of the areas that is key in the 21st century is addressing social protection and large minor social welfare is that we must also ensure that the environment is clear. I think that in the book, there was no any emphasis on green social transformation. In that sense, while we upscale the social welfare, we must ensure that the air is clean, the water is clean, and that the environment is protected. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof, for, for the wonderful, fantastic uh, discuss, discussion of this uh, wonderful book. Please, pardon me to circle back. I want to greet the honorary Professor Tade Aino. Moki Nikarosa, Ekaro, Nigeria Lawa, Oga. So, I want to know, I to session I could take off now into a calling house. So I'm greeting mm -hmm. our our father, intellectual father, social father, in, in our way. That most of them be more wise now. We go to go to the community. Okay, now since we are standing up, now I'm sitting. So you are welcome. So happy to see you. Thank you. And uh, it gives us great joy to we don't have the capacity to review a book that is written in your honor. But we just have to do the academic ritual of uh, presenting the book to the world and to celebrate you. We sincerely you. celebrate you, sir. We celebrate you. you. You you are a legend for us, and uh, we sincerely wish to to continue to be mentored by you, sir. And uh, your footprints are all over. Even in my university here, where I am, we are still we are still benefiting from from what you have done across. If I begin to mention them, I will take over the session. But just to say, sir, we really appreciate you. And we are very happy to be here today to do this, to review this work. And we thank you for providing leadership for us and people we can look up to. Each time your name comes up, even when you are not there, the whole place vibrates because you are you you, you, are, you are seriously celebrating, sir. So I just think, so I welcome everyone to help me welcome Professor Tadi, I know specially to this meeting. So we thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Akoli. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, okay. Um, I want to also welcome um, Professor Malala Kodri to please have your have your uh, discussion of this uh, wonderful book. After that, just make some statements. Then I will have the respondents to respond. So, Professor Malala Kodri, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, the chairman of the presentation. Um, I actually want to acknowledge what uh, the earlier speakers have said about the group. Uh, uh, Professor, I've not said if i today, actually talk much about uh, social, when you see social transformation, and my colleague there has actually brought us the linkages between all of the chapters. I want to say first and foremost that I need to appreciate the editors of this book for writing this kind of literature. Because for me, as a political scientist and uh, also in the area of public administration and policy analysis, uh, this session, I'm not going to hesitate to recommend this book because not even only that it's going to be very useful in the area of policy analysis because we have some cases of policy you know, uh, programs of government that um, authors have dealt so much with in terms of their analysis and theoretical framework as tools of analysis that will be so useful to students in that area, but also in the area of comparative uh, politics because we have cases across Africa and even beyond Africa that students of comparative politics can also benefit from. 
as well as international relations uh, when Professor Becky Will was talking about the philanthropy uh, in the area of trade of social provisioning and as it relates to cash transfer and all that all that. So it's a very useful compendium, you know, as and and I know students to benefit uh, for, 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 for this that I mean for a very long time. So I appreciate the editors. So uh I want to come from the area of policy and analysis. Uh, because there are many chapters in the book that actually focus on the programs of government, especially cash transfer. My chapter with the colleague in Kenya also focused in chapter 12, focus on the politics of cash distribution, and we use the um, palliative for the pandemic as our case study. And the this chapter nine also talked about uh, cash, uh, cash transfer and also Becky Williams. Uh, a chapter which focus more on the philanthropic aspect of this. Okay, so uh, it's good to have good policy, it's that, that we have good objectives in terms of social policies, which uh, social protection, cash and fire is an aspect of this. And like I need to tell my students, we can have policies with good objectives, but when it comes to implementation, we begin to have or think a different situation. And I think that's uh, actually resonates with uh, some chapter that actually focus on uh, cash transfer implementation, program implementation in several African countries. And uh, specifically on the on the palliative of the COVID-19 pandemic, our chapter actually um, uh, we, we try to look at the similarities and differences in terms of the conceived uh, how the program was conceived. We look at the institutional capacity of the countries that are implementing the program. Uh, we look at the collaborations of donors you know, within that context. And then more importantly, we look at the politics of the cash distribution itself, the cash transfer, situating within the political environment of policies where policies have to be implemented. And we discover, talking about the institutional capacity, Professor Babati did talk about the state. Of course, the state, the state has a role to play in all of this. But when we talk about policy, they are the everything takes place within the state. And then we have to also take it to uh, the, the philosophical aspect of it, the social contract theory. I think social uh, policy it's, it's also the primary function of the state. Because the state actually exists for the citizen to provide so many things for the citizen, including when policies of government. Uh, affects the citizen in a negative way. And that is where social policies, social uh, provisioning, social uh, cash transfer, social protection programs come into play to actually um, temper or to add to, to alleviate some of the, the consequences of such policies in terms of maybe uh, social exclusion, vulnerability, and all sorts. And so for that chapter where we look at the, the implementation of the COVID-19 uh, palliative in Kenya and in Nigeria, we discovered that first thing, there are institutional arrangements. When we talk about institutional talk about norms and behaviors. So actors within all of this policy arena, we have to look at them. Uh, it's like we are we want to unfreeze social action that see where those actors are located and what role did each of them play at one point or the other in ensuring that this policy is actually executed or implemented so that we can have at the end of the day or we can begin to evaluate the extent to which it's actually meeting its objectives. So from our findings in that chapter, we discovered that. Nigeria, for example, has limited capacity. Of course, there are institutional arrangements, like Chapter 9 by Dr. Elias, and looked at the reviews and reforms of some of those uh, social programs in Nigeria. So uh, it is safe to say that we have already institutional arrangements within which the ones for COVID-19 can actually fit in. But you discover at the end of the day that there are uh, some of them, act, those institutions, actors were not properly coordinated. So to the extent that at the end of the way, you evaluate 
you go to see the assessment, you want to do assessment of this performance of this uh, validities in terms of cash transfer. Uh, there are issues that were offset with the implementation. And same thing in Kenya, um, which my colleague actually handled. Um, um, yes, there are existing issues, you know, but to a greater extent, the program was able, I mean, the, the, of course, the implementers were able to incorporate all of this, but also not without the challenges that came with it. And so uh, we also moved further to look at the collaboration between partners. In Nigeria, too, we had donors here and there, but we also discovered that all of those activities were not coordinated. So that at the end of the whole thing, we, um, you begin to talk about the challenges of implementation of this program. And then we now, we, we, we situate it within the political environment. And take, then we take it to um, the fact that even when we talk about all of this social profession and social policies, they are also about who gets what when and how when we look at the political context. And then you cannot be talking about, like I said earlier, even if you have beautiful policy, good objectives and all of that, and you are able to commit resources to that particular program of government. But what should also bother implementers is the um, political feasibility of that policy or of that government program. And when I said earlier that we want to see the actors, we want to increase social action and see where actors are located. So what about the bureaucrats? What about different actors within different sectors that will implement this program? Are, are they keying in into this program? So that at the end of the day, we can have you know, a synergy between all of these coordinating areas. And I think we had that issue, that challenge with COVID-19 palliative. Like I said, few chapters are very talking about. It. And so our concern is that um, whatever we are doing, whatever policy or programs of government we are looking at, we should be also be conscious of the political disability of that program. If it is not, if that program is not really accepted by all of the actors, at the end of the day, we might have a problem. But um, like I said earlier, it's, it's, it's a very good um, endeavor for our students in policy area, in comparative politics, and uh, um, um, like I said, it's going to be a very useful resource for all of them. So in all, I think the book has actually um, dealt so much with the issue, with the subject matter, social policy transformation. Uh, and since uh, it, it's about the citizen, it's about the contract between the government and the citizen, there are so many chapters that actually look at the relationship between these two sets of the actors within the, the political action. So I think, uh, I am going to stop here and then maybe much later if we have some questions concerning that our chapter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Pro, uh, for that uh, very um, energetic and very real intervention, you know, um, in that place. And I, I'm, all, I'm particularly very fired up by the presentations that we have, uh, discussions we have had there uh, this morning. And when you were talking about, everybody was, I mean, was talking about this uh, book, uh, it just, you know, I, I also have a chapter in the book with uh, Professor Mabawale, you know, and I could see that there is a strong link, strong intellectual thread that cut across all of this. Even we also did, uh, when we did our own, uh, our chapter was actually on globalization, social policy and social protection in Nigeria from a critical perspective. You know, I could see what you are talking about with your work with, the, uh, uh, with Kenya and what we did. We also did something about conditional cash transfer in Nigeria. We also went ahead to talk about anchor borrowers program. You know, and uh, just like a prophetic book, <laughs> you know, some of those things, some of our arguments, in the book are actually coming into play into practice under the current regime. You know, the book was written during the immediate past regime in Nigeria. Some of the things we were arguing about the Anchor Borrower Program, police and DSS and EFCC are already chasing some people around now. You know, and the Anchor Borrower Program is actually suspended, technically speaking, and some people have been invited for questioning. Because some of you know, one thing that I, I love, you know, I, about the book also, 
And essentially, with the work of Professor, uh, you know, Tadi I know, is the fact that it's not just about academic for academy. It's about practice. I've, I've been following the footprints of Professor I know for a while now. You know, you see that it's about transformational social policy, transformational public policy, trans what, how can we achieve achieve true social policy? How can we achieve change? And you could see that wherever our program has gone, it's not just about uh, you know, just doing the thing like a random academy, it's about also putting something on the ground that can change the narrative and change the course of history. And we have programs that have been part of to innovate that have been institutionalized across African countries. You know, uh, so I think the book, I, I so love this book. I've seen a lot of books on social policy. I've seen a, a lot of book on public policy. I've seen a lot of writer. This book is particularly very practical. And it's against this program I want to say also encourage all of us beyond us publishing in this book, let us push this book into people's consciousness. Let us deliberately recommend them for our students. We can even put uh, content in this book in our course outline and recommend them. Give assignments to students in this book. Because you know, sometimes when we publish books, sometimes they are just a lot of the time. If we don't push it ourselves, nobody will push it. Don't forget we have competitors in this space in terms of intellectual material. And what I've seen in some other universities, especially in the North, is that when they publish book, it's part of the work on package, it's part of the resource for the students. They resume and they give it to them. In many African universities, we don't have this opportunity, especially in Nigeria, where they say you must not sell books to students, as if it's a taboo. You must not even, sometimes you even recommend your books to your students. They say, how can you be recommending your, are you forcing students to buy your books? You know, we are so much driven by negativity in some part of Africa. We don't celebrate ourselves. We don't value what you have. You have a book on Africa, you'll be recommending a book from, uh, uh, from America, from some other places for the students without, I was examining some students recently on PhD, many of them across university. Some of them, they don't even cite their supervisors. And I took it very personal. Somebody is supervising your PhD. Are you saying the person has never worked in that area? Not that the person is looking for citation, but we must appreciate what we have and push our, some of the narratives in this book. There are no narratives we've seen in some other books. I've looked at this book carefully. Some of the, from the argument, you won't see other in some other places. So we have to please push these books. If it is only my contribution today, I think it's worth my while. Let's push it, let's recommend it, let's cite it ourselves. If you are working in the area that we have in this book, let's intentionally cite this book. And that can also make others to cite when they read our publication. This is the logic of citations. And when these are books become bestsellers. So I, I think uh, I, I just like to make that affirmative uh, statement to, to help. So thank you very much, uh, the, the discussants and um, Interestingly, uh, Professor Tadia now is the first person to respond. Uh, after that, Professor Fume Bameke, after that, Professor Oluwadare Eduro Wade, and Professor Samuel Olongo. Professor Tadia, I know the floor is yours, sir. Please respond. To some Thank so you very we much, have uh, technically um, 40 minutes or 39 minutes left. So we can still take like uh, five to eight minutes. Thank you very much, Prof. The floor, the floor is yours. Happy to be here with you. Thank you, Dr. Akonle, and uh, thank you, uh, discussants, Professor Abosa Di Babatunde, Prof. Becky Moyo, Professor David Oke, and uh, Professor Omolara Podri. I also want to thank the editors, Professor Bameke, Professor Lontoba, and of course, Professor Durowade. It's good to see you, it's at so. least when the camera showed you. <laughs> you know, I am very humbled. I'm very humbled that it was like a, this was like a kind of ambush when it was done. And people were collected. The word sifted to me, but you know, people were, uh, colleagues were collected who wanted to contribute to this book. And when I was looking at it, and uh, Dr. Akonde, you are very right. One of the things we struggled with in Kodesria was Africans citing Africans. 
And it's also the thing that is struggle, that is a big struggle in the women's movement and the feminist movement. Women citing the writings of women on their issue. And of course, uh, Professor Lontoba now beginning to work in the areas of indigenous knowledges and indigenous communities. It is nothing about us without us. So all of these things about how do we build an intellectual movement? How do we build, how do we build transformative movements? How do we have a social project in the work that we have done? And like uh, one of the articles I wrote many years ago, uh, there are many routes to the marketplace. The Yorubas will see on Okon Waja. There are many routes to the marketplace. And there are many routes to these uh, dealing with big questions that we face, both in African development and in African human condition. I actually do not want to reduce the discussion, particularly uh, Dr. Uh, Professor David Okay, I know you are okay. I, I know you are an economist. I, I I think one of the good things about this book is that it demonstrated polyvalent intellectualism, and it's so it's a, it's integrative. It's not siloed, although people came at it from different perspectives, and that I think has been the struggle of my own intellectual mission and project. And, it's, and that's why the sites of engagement starts with the universities, which is the core of this work going forward, move from the university. Even in the universities, there I remember a very interesting debate when uh, the opportunities of a university chair was asked, was being discussed about my work many, many years ago, uh, Professor Kodri and uh, Professor Bameke. Uh, I had that uh, some of my senior professors at that time who were considering my situation. One of them said, where is this man's field? Eh? What exactly is his field? And you know, in the University of Lagos and in the Nigerian Anglo-Saxon intellectualism, they want to see you focused on just one field. And yet the human condition is not a field. It's not a singular field. And we are not cattle that graze in one field. So interestingly, the demand, and then another, I had that two other, uh, Professor Bameke, two other senior professors said, he is intellectually versatile. <laughs> it's not about one field, but it's about intellectual versatility. And I think that is one of the things that has come to demonstrate itself in this book. I've seen vision, I've seen values, I've seen theory, I've seen action and I've seen practice. And I think that is what we should all be. And, I, and I've seen provocation. I've actually seen people who really disagreed with me seriously. And then when Professor Abbas said they talked about it, I like the fact that you brought back the issues of human values and human condition and the role of non-state actors. I've also, I've never been focused on state except as a critical uh, uh, engagement because I've always worked in non-state sectors apart from the university which was a public sector institution so I want to say a big thank you I think it's a child I'm glad it's provoking debate and the point I'm saying is that our transformation and change the you know significant transformative journey in Africa is not a single route let nobody either the IMF, the World Bank, the different schools of economics, the neoliberal school, the Keynesian school, the sociologists, the social activists, all of us, let nobody say there is one and only one way. No institution, no country was ever transformed. No nation, no people were ever transformed through one way. It is multi-pronged, it is multifocal, it is polyvalent. It's all of us coming from several angles. And that's all I can say about this. I, there are chapters there that I don't agree with, that I disagree. I would like to have a good debate with some of them, you know. Uh, and I like the, you know, so I see within here conventional economics, conventional social welfare practice, public administration, 
social policy sociology. I see the philosopher and theologian, Professor Lukmono, there in terms of the thinking. And I see the, the people I'll call my good friend, the critical theories. Ayoba uh, Miojebodi and uh, the distinguished professor in terms of the tackling of the social imaginary beyond the sociological imagination. I think all of this is valid. And I hope, as uh, Dr. Akonle said, this book will provoke debates, interventions, thinking that goes beyond people like me. I was only a bridge. I consider my lifelong career has been that of a bridge. I hope the young, younger colleagues in the room, the students we are teaching, the upcoming researchers whom in my in my work, in um, in my work yes. basically in philanthropy, the last time I said to somebody, actually the six years we did in philanthropy at the Carnegie Corporation of New York contributed to supporting over a thousand PhDs on the continent across the board and so and and, and that that is it that is the kind of thing but we're they are not monolithic the, you know they were in science they're in social science they were in humanities the african humanities program and all of those things so, so that's the kind of work it is you are all creators of our realities and co-creators of our realities both in terms of your imagination in terms of your vision in terms of your values, the contestation of values, theories, actions, and practices. So I thank you all for this opportunity, for this honor. I'm still touched. I'm dazed. I struggled to finish the book. I read it and I said, wow, what wealth of information. What wealth of ideas. And Dr. Akonle, I did something. I looked at the citation of everybody to see, did I, did I get a place in this? Did, some, did somebody read Something that I did a long time ago, but like somebody, <laughs> they, but like somebody said, you know, in Nigeria we keep talking about uh, emeritus. Now, uh, Professor Olontoba and Professor Bameke, you will laugh at this one. We talk about everybody, every professor is an emeritus, even if they've stopped teaching thirty years ago. We were just joking yesterday that maybe. They are expired professors. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you said, you know, maybe they are expired professors because you'll be wondering when last did they read anything new and things like that. So, you know, occasionally that's also another big challenge for us to continue to renew ourselves as we go forward. This opportunity has been an opportunity of immense renewal for me. I've been able to read the thoughts of new generations of scholars. Thank you very much. And Dr. Akonle, thank you for the introduction. My good friend, Becky Moyo, thank you. And colleagues, Professor Kodri, good to see you. Good to see you after a long time. I hope, I hope the MRPP is still functioning. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Akoli. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, in fact, uh, let me answer your last question from the perspective of the University of Ibadan. The MRPP is still functioning. Is the VVVIP VVVIP very, very, very uh, important uh, personality of the course in, in the university? Highly competitive. Well, we, so we must thank you. And I just want to emphasize, I want to mention one or two things that you, I took some notes when you were talking, sir. I quite agree with you in terms of describing yourself as a bridge, intergenerational bridge, you know, vertically and horizontally. I didn't want to be so specific earlier when I was talking about a lot of uh, transformative, practical interventions that you have made in African universities, particularly. And the MRPP is one, which I will have mentioned then. And happy that you mentioned it. it has its, and the kind of crop of students we are building in that program, I'm sure they will be top notch. Based on the architecture that you have that you have developed, then I also agree with you that we should engage development practices of the West, especially I've shown to us by the Asian, Asian Tiger and even China, particularly, that we can shorten our paths to development, not necessarily following the established orthodox approaches. And and, and I agree with you about intellectual versatility. It's better 
Usually now some universities are now telling us about duplicity. That when you publish in one direction, they say you are republishing yourself. And, and they refuse to promote some people. So you have seen, you are a man that have seen the future in the way you were you engage very early. So thank you very much. Uh, it's not one way. I agree with you. And for the emeritus professor, aspired professor, is a major issue here. Bro, he's a big one. People say they have paid their dues. People think it's just to become professor. After that, it's to rest. Why are, why are people resting when they're supposed to be professing? It's a debate we will take further. And we are happy that it's called, you acknowledge that today. And we appreciate you. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, I took some notes, and I'm sure this note will follow me to the future as I continue to move. So thank you for giving us another from your word of experience. Professor Fumiba Meke, the floor is yours. Okay, in thank five you so much. Minutes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, as I came for this opportunity. I think I would like to also be professor. Um, I know, um, like so good, good to see you, Paul. And uh, I'm happy that we were able to uh, to make this. And um, initially, I was thinking oh, we needed to apologize for the fact that um, the book was late. We we had a deadline. We were trying to. Uh, uh, mark a particular milestone for Brock. But as it turned out, just I had been publishing in most times, we couldn't meet that target. But all the same, uh, the book came out and uh, we're very happy. I would also like to start by saying that uh, in terms of focusing on an area of uh, specialization, well, that's what it's called. And that's what I think Brock was referring to when his case was being considered. Gradually, there's a realization now that uh, multidisciplinary uh, research, uh, that, that's the way to go interdisciplinary. And uh, rather than work in silos, it's better for people to collaborate and work in different um, areas. That realization is, is coming up and it's catching up gradually, but you find even colleagues from College of Beth State working with sociologists, with uh, college and social work, and we, it, we are all the better for it because the knowledge expansion and the fact that nobody can really do it alone and uh, the multiplicity is helping um, everyone. So it's again that background that in this book, nobody was um, approaching any, any topic. So the idea was that the areas in which uh, Professor Omotadea in our honorary had excelled, and there are many. So people try to look at what areas, how, how can they control it? Is it a social policy, social transformation? Is it in higher education? Is it in philanthropy? Or is it just in the act of actually turning all the theories and the conceptualization into reality by touching people's lives? You really, so that you really can see that action, uh, whatever theories you put up are being backed by action. And in reality, those lives are being touched. And so when the topic started coming in, and really couldn't pigeonhole people and put them in a particular thing. So we're just accepting um, as we're coming, and those were able to meet the deadline. And of course, the quality also of the submissions also mattered, and so on. And then this was not also a kind of a all. So there were people to whom craft was so precious and they were adamant. In fact, that's one of the reasons why we were delayed. They were adamant that we should not move forward without them. You know, I remember that I didn't even believe that professor Ulupan uh, uh, was, I did not believe that they would ever make the uh, publication, but he did because he gave a very uh, strong warning. So I want to thank everyone who has spoken. Um, the others came from that background of. Uh, Using multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approaches to do their work you know, together, just to be able to project one aspect or the other from Professor um, Aino's lifelong uh, work, which is still going on. I want to appreciate Professor Abosebe for what he said, but I think that Professor Poetry maybe inadvertently responded to her, you know, on the issue of not actually involving, uh, there's no sufficient emphasis on non-state actors. And she responded by actually explaining the fact that the state is everywhere. I mean, you can't talk about policy, you know, without uh, 
bringing in to the state. And then, in terms of the intention of government, you know, I think government has very good intention doing this has also been surrounded today. But the idea of protecting citizens is very good. But for us in Nigeria, bringing it back home, find that all the efforts of government at uh, protecting citizens always have a role of either backfiring or is not well thought out or the no political uh, will to back it up. But because of lack of transparency, because of um, corruption, which is a real big elephant in the room, uh, we don't talk about it again because we know it's, it's there. So corruption, uh, the courtesy, and the rest of them actually affect the implementation of the policy of, of government. That also came out from what and from some of what we uh, discussants have, have said. I think I will just conclude by saying that um, what Prof talked about, the intellectual versatility, is actually the intention you know, of, of this room. The idea is that we wanted to reflect you know, the various fields, the various interdependent fields, uh, and want to also reflect how much you know, they are also connected. Who are you talking about the fact that they are interdependent, also connected? That's what we wanted to uh, reflect. And I'm happy that from the comments we've had and those we've also had from other that it could have fulfilled uh, its purpose. So the major assignment that we have pushing it, apart from the getting big uh, on sale in Amazon, real pushing it, we are putting heads together. I did not look like you, I also had that same challenge. But we had a challenge here where uh, recently the university came up with policies of exactly the way for our liberties. You don't sell your books, you don't. Not that you can't recommend your books, but recommend your books, or you should go to the bookshop and purchase your books. And in the bookshop, at least we need a live bookshop. Some of us have had our fingers burnt. We got so much because maybe now they're changing because they are also partly autonomous. But in the past, it became very difficult to account for your books, to account for everything. But now we're going to try and see how we can. It should be beyond even like if the, the publishers, we also have the word of the publishers to try and permit other uh, bookstores and, and libraries and everywhere. But we're going to work on it. We're going to make sure that it doesn't just uh, end on the shelf. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bameke. Uh, yeah, we also tried it at some time of taking this good full uh, book to the bookshop. Ne we did not see ne we did not see the proceeds and the books evaporated from the bookshops. So, but we will be fine. We will not let anything stop us from contributing to knowledge. <laughs> we are we are resolute and we are resilient. We will keep publishing and keep making our scholarship relevant. Thank you very much, Ma, for, for that perspective. And I'm sincerely very grateful. So, uh, so it's, I, will want, I want to welcome Professor Oluwadare Durowade for, to, make, uh, is to respond. And uh, you are very welcome, Professor Oluwadare Durowade. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're here for May I have one? Yes. Okay. I can say good afternoon to everyone present. And this time, coming in contact with folks I knew again after a very long time. And I remember, as part of the social policy system, that when I finished my master's, that I was coming and be part and parcel of the social process to reproduce themselves so that after he and his emeritus professors have left, <laughs> We the children can be left behind, you know, to continue the process. But unfortunately, the children are also swept away by the policies, you know, that sort of things cannot help. We turn off. But my own perception of social policy has been that social policy are more or less in two ways. There's social policy in process and in a social policy in action. People will come and they will critique to take social policy. 
And as a result of that, you see people wanting to abandon the implementation, uh, implementation of that social policy in Israel face a lot of problems because of that single critique. But when we go back and then we try to put issues together and see what we can do is to improve that social policy that has been criticized when social policy is in process. There is no clear called social policy that is brought out and that shift is process like the People will shift in the process. Some people will want to bypass the process. The, the social policy. So in that process, the so-called analysts or implementers or implementers will come to the last, what can we do to improve this? What can we do to improve that? And in the process, actions will take place. And everybody will say, oh, so if you have done it this way, this will have worked. And that is why we said, you know, in, in, before you can bring in any social policy, those three prerequisites are very important. We have to realize that the problem is there. We have to realize that something can be done to solve the problem. And we've got to realize that, yes, even when we have the process is there, the problem is there, something has been done, to realize that there are adequate funding. If the money is not there to implement, what are we going to do? You know? And let's look at the Anangelis issue in the North. Many of the leaders over there never saw it as a problem. And that's why we have this problem now. Many of them at the initial stage, the leaders, the culture. Some people are born to serve others. That is the culture. And so when some other people like outsiders call and they start with something else to be done about this issue, they don't see that uh, as a problem. That's why no, no, no policy is, was put in place to address those issues until the consequences start coming in. The people start to realize that, ah, we are on our hand fingers and something has to be done. Unfortunately, it's rather too late. My problem again is the mentality of Africans, our culture, our thinking, even with our level of education sometimes. Education, we, we, we pass through education, but then education never passed to us. Why should rumors go around that that rich man in the community who has started to put the policies, you know, that the policy now, that may feed this floor every Friday. And the rumor will not go out at the so Every one of you that goes there to eat, that guy is using your stars and destiny and you never need to take that. And the rumor will go out, and before you think about it, you know, one like that in the world, the evil, the protest soon came out of that, and they didn't want to release their life because they didn't stop, and they didn't to stop. So I begin to ask myself, what can we do to kind of educate such thinking and thoughts even among the educated? It's a very complex process. And you see so that part of the social problem or policy that says in process is for this man to now say, oh, the best thing for me is to stop. You'll be hurting some people. So, in an attempt for us to be able to have that social policy in action, a lot of other policies have to come in. I have to educate the people. We have to you know, assure them that, that the man that's doing this thing or trying to sit out this thing in process. And it's, it's a good man. And unfortunately, the government of the country, many African countries, from my own perception, is like a man with so many wives and so many children. And he finds it difficult to meet the needs of those defenders. And that's why we say, what can we do at our level as private citizens and private individuals you know, to improve 
this planet. Yesterday, I was passing through my former community, uh, Ogba Shadi, somewhere along the Nigeria. And I said, God, I go poverty that I mean the way from. Still very much persistent and continuous in the community. Even worse, because the actual population now, the whole place is on the bed. You can't walk freely. And there are all serious problems for students. And I begin to think, what can we do? And that eventually took me to the valley. I said, oh, thank God you are home now. You want to bring those dollars for me? <laughs> <laughs> it is when I have settled my problem and I'm told that I cannot know what to do. What do I need You are the one who's supposed to bring us together. Let's hold meetings together and see how we can. And sometimes, if you made some government policies that people seem to be abandoning, like when it comes to drainage, nobody cares. I think there's a policy about drainage. There's a policy on how you can construct your houses. Most of the houses constructed were too big for the land. I said, you see, uh, Gary, I have told you several times that the sociology has made you mad. Oh, before you left the country. And right now, you are even mad. <laughs> Yeah. And that, that was how we made it. The so at the end of the day, I was suspecting. When, sorry, when the leaders ask such orientation, what do you think of the politics? See, when the leader is not forthcoming with you know the forthright solution, you see the problem on the first part you think of yourself. And that's how everybody gets to things. So I and I believe social policies can be put in place to address this issue. And some of them are addressing it. Thank you very much, Prof, for that uh, very practical and environmental analysis of the development issues. Thank you very much, sir. It's always a pleasure to hear you speak. And uh, so, um, we are now cruising home. We have uh, 10 minutes to the end of this session. But if you, I'm sure you agree with me that it's been a very wonderful session. So we want to hear from Professor Samuel Olorun Toba himself. And I must appreciate you, sir, for your effort during the production of the book. So, Professor Olorun Toba, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Chair. And thanks for coming. I want to start by appreciating uh, the honoree for giving us the privilege to um, do this in this honor. And like what the family just said, it was actually to his milestone 78 year anniversary. Uh, that was uh, three years ago. Uh, two days ago was his birthday. Can we say how to do this? I will start by saying, how did I come to know Google Italian? It was through this book when I was doing a master's at the University of Lagos, Globalization and Social Policy. And I said, who is this person? Who writes like this? It was probably like Google That was our first video for it. Put the books as usual with some scholars. And um, one day he was passing through uh, where we were here in the lab. And somebody said, let me focus on Italian. I said, I'm ready to watch you. So I ran to go and watch you. Because that's what I do with all big professors. So, because if I've read you, I want to talk to you. And that was the starting point, and uh, the, the relationship continued. So, I uh, thank you again for giving us this opportunity. And thank you to my co editor, who is a filmmaker, who was our literary expert, uh, and the producer, Drew Wadding. He actually connected me with Professor Drew Wadding. And you can say that uh, now we are taking those together. <laughs> thank you so much. So the book, thank you to all the discussant. The uh, viewpoint of race is very uh, important. Uh, for me, as a political economist, I can't agree more with Mr. Uh, um, Audrey about the role of the state in and the social contract that binds the state and the city together. 
we are just going to be deceiving ourselves if we say that uh, the state has no role to play. This is your policy. Or uh, even social protection, the goal that helps you to get on is just um, a, a kind of departure from what is really there. Is the cosmetic approach to addressing the issue of uh, you know, empowering the citizens. And this is the point of social digitalization of emphasis uh, in, this, in, this, in this work that social protection is not it. We need uh, transformative social policy. And I get a lot from the contributions, uh, contributions of this book. Um, the, the fact that we are not in the, in the first decade of independence, I'm going to tell you how I this in some of his work, the early post-colonial leaders they made real effort to transform social policy through education, through health and pension. But the neoliberal turn, you know, changed all that. And then the World Bank, the IMF, who will be first for the high risk of development, believe that they have all the answers, which is where I disagree with our economist uh, colleague, that you know that the World Bank wants to remove poverty. So they are not changing the structure of global accumulation. They are not doing anything to change that structure of extractive accumulation. So it is very important. Another thing that I pick from this book is the issue of reimagination, which we also talked about. So we need to remind the social policy. We need to look at our own system. How are we doing it before the colonial intrusion? How can we you know, for grant our agency? As African without somebody somewhere coming to dictate to us what we need. Which is why the issue of our indigenous knowledge project is very important. Now we're working to recover the knowledge that we have before. And the last thing I will say is about the issue of human value, compassion, kindness, which Professor Kadia can also uh, wrote about. And Professor Fumi Olofi Shaku, we are in the of chapter, talk so much about it. That we cannot disentangle social policy for compassion and truth. The elites that are stealing us blind in their compassionate, I think they will think differently. And they will think beyond cosmetic and tokenism, you know, that they will cash money. Rather, education should be empowered. We need social policy that is empowering, that can take us from where we are to the next level, which I think is the whole essence of our social transformation. So thank you again for this opportunity and thanks for all to the audience. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me now, sir? Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah thank you yes. very much, uh, Professor. Uh, it's always a pleasure to hear you speak. Um, so I was thinking you would give us the usual vibes of uh, we can. I'm sure you can talk about that for the next one two hours, but I'm sure you are you are constrained, you know, because we are we are virtual. So you are we are pressed for time, and maybe because we're so tired, I know it's in the house, so you don't want to <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to watch two things. But well, it's always a pleasure. I know you're a fantastic scholar. So um, thank you very much. Um, it's been a wonderful session, particularly. Thank you, everybody. It gives me great joy to be given the opportunity to chair this session. And um, the, 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 we have a lot of takeaways from what uh, Professor Tadi and has told us today. I've taken my notes, and I will run with them. Thank you for all the interventions, the, the panelists. I appreciate you most sincerely. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Abosa Dibaba today. Thank you very much, Professor Becky Moyo. Thank you very much, Professor David Oke. Thank you very much, <laughs> Professor <laughs> Omola Kodri. So I thank you very much, uh, the honoree, for making time. I know you are very busy. Thank you very much for also sharing your, your thoughts with us uh, as the ones you are mentoring. Thank you, my sister, Professor Fumi Bameke. Thank you, Professor Lua Dare Duro Wade. And thank you, Professor Samwe Olorun Toba. Thank you, the, all the editors of that book. You did excellent work to make sure the book came out. I remember how much I will talk to Professor Olorun Toba. Even with the trying difference, it will respond in record time. And thank you very much for the efficiency, everybody. And thank you for making it. Uh, we have a thank you. Yes.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. uh, so we have three minutes. I want Professor Tade I know, to speak to Ross and give us the final one from this week. For the three minutes. Okay. Question. Yes. Hello. Question from the audience. Do we have questions? But we have two minutes. I don't know how we want to manage the two minutes. Okay, question from the audience. Question. Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to make a comment concerning um, the seeming or is it seeming or just the disconnect between uh, social policy and the realities on the ground, and uh, that is always a, an issue, especially for people who are on the streets who see a certain part of the road that is untied for 15 years, and then remembers for those who are in history that uh, in colonial Lagos, for instance, within 10 years, there was a Lagos consulate. If there can be a Lagos consulate established by a certain group of people for 10 years, you see a particular part of the road that is not constructed for 15 years, for 17 years. And you know, that disconnect is always resonating in the minds of people. That's just my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do we have more comments or questions from the floor? Please go ahead. Professor. Professor. Please go ahead with your question or comment. No question. Professor, I not the floor. Okay, now, okay. Professor, I know. Please help us take that. Uh, help us respond to the disconnection between social policy and reality on the ground in Africa. And you give us the final thoughts, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, Professor Duro Wade had mentioned it when he made the distinction between social policy in process social po and social policy in action. And uh, occasionally, I might even include the issue of social policy in imagination <laughs> as a third level of this disconnect. I think the most important part is imagination, action, and process must all translate into realities. And that translation is a combination of the political and the cultural, the context, and the and, and that brings you know when you read uh, Professor Ayede's discussion of citizenship, you heard uh, Professor Codry's uh, conversation around uh, social contract. I think we need. I am in Nairobi now for a meeting, and I saw what Gen Z did, even though the the death well uh, the death and the the destruction was painful. But you had a group of young people who came out and made their demand. And they were not violent. They were not violent until something happened this week. They had been on the streets, all sorts of, and it was in multi-class. It was multi, for the first time in Nairobi street demonstration, those of you who follow street demonstrations in, in Africa, you had the largest number, over 250,000 young people from across the slums, the upper class, even some of them, their parents were praying to God while the children were on the streets. Universities also, so they came and put pressure. That finance bill has been withdrawn. The problem is we have to analyze that again more significantly. The Arab Spring, the answers, and this one. Why is it that some of these new formations don't have identifiable leaders, but do they translate into movements? Fascinating. So we have to put pressure. There's no change without sacrifice. The nationalists made some sacrifices. There were all kinds of things, the Mau Mau War, the Abba Women riots, all sorts of things. The inheritors of the struggles were not necessarily the actors on the streets. You know, Fumilayo Ransom Kuti, for whom a new movie has just been made. People like that were some of the people who paid the dues for the transition that we have. So I'll just like, I will just put that because that is a that is a fact, uh, an issue really after my own heart. Uh, 
So I want to say a big thank you to everybody. I want to say the work is not finished. I hope the work is dynamic. I hope the young people around, including our colleague who just asked the last question, you will take this beyond the vistas that some of us said. All of us who are here, who contributed to that book, we are, the, we are foundations, we are bridges, we are stones, stepping stones. You take it forward, but please do not see yourself as intellectuals or academics that are not connected to practice or connected to action. You must be an organic intellectual. You must connect yourself to some movement or the other. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank you very much, Prof. In fact, I deliberately gave you the floor. I know we will drink more from your whole knowledge. So, and I want to emphasize something. Prof said something which I want us to take home, all of us, as we begin to recommend this book and push this book. Number one, Prof said the work is not finished. We must continue to push the ideas in this book and the ideas of Professor Tadi I know in terms of the number two, Prof said the work must be dynamic and we must be dynamic as scholars. Fantastic thought there. Number three, Prof said we must be connected to practice. We must not just be academics in the class. Academics just publish books. Academics just doing things within the four walls of the university. But we must put our foot boots on the ground in communities and lend our voice practically, globally for Africa. And we must be, number four, we must be organic scholars, organic intellectuals, wherever we find ourselves. These are powerful words, and they are parting short. Uh, on that note, I thank you, Prof, most sincerely for mentoring all of us and many more who are unable to attend this event, also for sharing your thoughts with us, also for gracing this meeting with your presence. On this note, I thank everybody for making time. My day is made, and, and I celebrate every one of us. Thank you very much and see you at some other time. Bye for now. <laughs>